Anne Ireri is the executive director of the Federation of Women Lawyers in Kenya. Yes. Of Women Lawyers of Kenya. It's in Kenya. In Kenya. The Federation of Women Lawyers in Kenya, FIDA. You're also in mm. ELOG and we're asking ourselves, so what is she in ELOG? She's the chair of ELOG. Yes. What is ELOG? Uh, so ELOG is a premier domestic observation platform in the country, comprising of almost 20 uh, civil society organizations representing the faith-based sector, the democracy sector, and uh, other interest groups who collectively have come together to make sure that we play a part as citizens uh, in monitoring our elections. And you also want that ownership and leadership by the citizens themselves mm. in processes as important as elections. So, so that's do you only monitor place. the election day, the election exercise? Not at all. We work within the cyclic nature of elections. And we know elections uh, in this country are every five years. And so there are certain milestones as a country we must achieve within the period. So we try to make sure that elections are not the election day. There's so much work that has to go in before. Actually, the election day is just a culmination of everything. Mm. So as citizens, we also need to be aware of what's happening within the cyclic uh, uh, events of an election, but also participate. And participation is in various forms. So mm. that's what we try to seek uh, to undertake as ELOG. Well, Karibu sana Asante. once again to the hot seat of the Situation Room. Asante. City has the day's proverb. I do. This week's proverbs are from uh, the country of Lesotho. Written Lesotho, pronounced mm. Lesotho. Mm -hmm. Why, I have absolutely no idea. Mm. But there it is. Mm. A monarchy. You know, is this such a term as a democratic monarchy? <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Hmm. Why not? I mean, hmm. it, it I is know, a democratic not, monarchy. Not possible. It is possible because, is possible. because, because the, the, it's the, the opposite of an absolute monarchy. monarchy. Yes, mm. because mm. I, democracy, by its very nature, is aspirational. Mm. Uh, it's, it's assumed. Uh, yes, that you, there's there's never a point when you can say we have attained it. You're always seeking mm. to improve on it and to gain. But on you it. can't elect a monarchy. And ah. the tenant, foundational tenant. Of, we're back, we're back to philosophy here, thought, aren't we? Mm. No, no, no. I thought it's to is an election. Is, yes, is is a government for by the people. For yes, people. the head of government of a country mm. is elected. Mm. The head of state is the monarch mm. who is not elected. Mm. So yes. is that a democracy or is it not? Like in the UK, yeah, yeah. Mm. or like it's in Lesotho. Constitution. It's not even a constitutional democracy. Depends. Like in Lesotho, mm. yes. they, oh. ele they elect their leaders. Mm. Right. They elect their prime minister, but, mm. but the king ascends to the throne yes mm -hmm. what are his powers i guess we have a head of state mm -hmm. lawyer here mm. head of government advise. head of government is elected so is that a democracy or is it not mm. and if you have a head of state and head of government who is the same person mm -hmm. is that a democracy or is it a dictatorship right mm -hmm. Good like, in, question. like in kenya mm. and if you want to ask this question, <laughs> that's why i said that this very topic and the very concept of democracy it's aspirational yes people speak about as though the moment you say it's a democracy, it's a yeah, given, it and you become. understand. Mm -mm, mm -mm. It's always, a, it's always a work in progress. Mm -hmm. It never stops being a work in progress. And a kind of continuum mm -hmm. in yes. terms of yes. the extent of which powers. You yes. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, constituent uh, continuum is also the proverb. <laughs> <laughs> Today, what, what are you? Hey, this is this is what happens when you have like eight hours of sleep. <laughs> yeah. What's the, what's the actual problem from Lesotho? All the, all the neurons are firing at once. Constituent <laughs> continuum. Wow. Well. Democracy. <laughs> well, in this instance, and we we'll talk about this particular instance. Okay, mm -hmm. when a ripe fruit sees an honest man, it drops. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> and when a ripe fruit sees an honest man, yes. it drops. Mm. Drops what? It drops down. Itself. <laughs> it drops itself. <laughs> Eric, you know you started this thing early in the morning. Eh? We're talking about the fruit. He was on the money at 6 a.m. <laughs> yes, yes, we're talking about the fruit. The fruit. The yes. fruit itself drops. It the fruit gas, as in mango. Dropped. Okay. <laughs> As in grapes. It gets shocked and it falls. As in avocado. <laughs> We're still talking about fruit. And you mm. know this question we asked? Yes. It's avocado. Is it a vegetable or is it a vegetable? <laughs>
Interesting. I think it's a food. It's an herb. I was told mm. super super food. It's a super food. Yeah. It's a super food. Yeah, it, it can be both actually. Mm. So yeah. it's like ngwashe. Yes. You can't be wrong with that answer. It's a super food. <laughs> no. Ngwashe is not a super food. It is a super food. Oh, yeah, it's a super but food. It's not, but, it's it's not, not, but it's not a food. <laughs> no. It's eaten by super many you people. You can see this proverb is I know really mixing us up. What's your interpretation of the proverb? And um when a ripe fruit sees an honest man it drops it drops i think for me um i mean the essence of the ripe fruit is that you need to eat it and it nourishes your body i would interpret it as a form of a reward for honesty uh which is important i think the fact that it acknowledges that you have earned to have it uh, which is a motivation i think for me it is it serves to motivate us to try to be honest because then there's a reward mm. for being honest that's how i interpret it the big question though yes. is how do you define honesty maybe honesty could you know step in for right could be a play on words mm. at the right time the right person the right person will make things Move. happen or things will happen as they were destined to be at the right time. Mm. Mm. I'm asking you that in the context of what we're going to discuss today, which is just looking broadly at chapter six of our constitution, mm. leadership and integrity. Yes. You know, when Wanjiru was giving us her own interpretation of it, she took it into leadership mm. and said, you know, in Kenya, this proverb cannot apply because <laughs> first getting a ripe fruit in Kenya, mm. ngumu. Oh. getting an honest person in Kenya, even ngumu. <laughs> Yes. And I disagreed. <laughs> and even if you find an honest fruit, and the right, then it will, be the it will not tree. accept to fall down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the honest man will not agree to walk by the tree. Because, yes. I said because we didn't understand it. <laughs> In simple terms, please. Yeah. So, Anne, <laughs> what is this all about? I mean, when, when you, if you think about it, you said it's a reward for honesty. Yes. In, con in the context of our conversation. I think for me, I would look at it as a country and narrowing down to the question of leadership and integrity, I think that for us, the temptation as a country is to always focus on the political leadership, which is part and parcel of the integral leadership ecosystem. But leadership must start at the basics. There are various institutions in our country that so badly require leadership and integrity. And collectively, that's how we aspire towards chapter six. If you look at whether it's our schools, whether it's our community centers, whether it's the quality of life and what's happening at the grassroots level of our country, there are various elements of integrity and leadership that must be questioned and we have to get it right. We always say often as a country, our leadership is a product of ourselves. We are reflected as a nation through the quality of leaders we put in place, whether it's in political leadership, mm. whether it's at local level. So for me, as we question and look at the leadership aspect as a country, I personally consciously tell myself to not just focus on that high level leadership, which is where we always point towards, but we must start having the conversation at our homes, within our communities, at personal level. I mean, they always say, uh, the test for leadership at, and, and integrity is if no one else is watching you, would you do the right thing? Mm -hmm. And if we can answer that, as um, idealistic as it sounds, that's a basic for me for us to have that conversation as a country. So leadership comes all the way down to the smallest unit. Absolutely. Say a family unit. Yes. <coughs> do we have honest leaders then in this country? starting from that family unit mm. going all the way up the way you've just described yes. if no one else is watching would you do the right thing for me i'll use the example and the reality of where i work which is fida kenya and by virtue of our work we really do um I deal with a lot of cases at the lowest level which is a family mm -hmm. <laughs> and as a kenyan sitting at fida kenya when i look at a lot of the strife, a lot of the cases that present themselves to, to us, whether it's directly or through our, our partners, that speaks to the quality of uh, whether it's leadership, whether it's the kind of society we are bringing up. Mm. We should not have cases where we have to take you to court unless you really have a reason not to take care of your child. Mm. Why should you, why should 
parting ways as a couple be so brutal and violent? Isn't there a way out? Why should we speak of femicide? Why should we speak of, of, of defilement of small children, then expect miracles within the other context? And I say this because um, I know we often speak a lot about what's happening within the political uh, arena, but as, as a women's movement, I'll use where I work again, we've raised a lot of questions about how we treat the most vulnerable within our community. As FIDA Kenya, I personally have been part of we, we've organized demonstrations where we've had such gruesome cases of violence against women. Mm. And of course, then because it was not so much in the political arena, people would not take so much note. But we have been on the streets of the country as collectively as a women's movement. So back to your question, Eric, I feel that for us to nurture the leadership that we need as a country, we must start at the family level and we must create safe spaces for children to grow up, children who are not overly exposed to vices within the nation, whether it's corruption, whether it's rejection, whether it's lack of integrity, whether it's a violence, because you cannot raise a young generation filled with violence and expect miracles at leadership. So we must heavily invest as a nation. We must have the conversation within the family. We must mainstream it in terms of what we are teaching our children, mm -hmm. then we can start speaking of having leaders that we can hold to account. But as we speak, mm -hmm. what we have is a reality that has been years and years of whether we have normalized corruption, whether we've no normalized abuse, we have normalized not doing the right thing. I mean, why is it as a country that if you have a public service vehicle or any public space, and I forget my pass and the Matatu owner finds my, my, my parts, we have to celebrate that. I mean, that should be the most basic and mundane of things. So we have to reflect, and sadly, I think for us as a country, that train of, of not having integrity has long left the station, but mm. we have to force it one way or the other. That's the only place, in my view, the redemption of the country lies. How can these conversations and then onto action mm -hmm. take place simultaneously with this rat race that we talk about as the yes. reason why we don't, we don't pay attention to what many would say are subjective issues, mm -hmm. morals and mm -hmm. things like that? Um, and that is... How can you sit here and talk about right and wrong and what we should be doing when we're trying to look for food to eat? You mm -hmm. get. Um, and so when we say that these things ought to happen, Anne, mm -hmm. how ought they to happen? What? Ne how? And I think that's the conflict, oftentimes, or the difficult, the, the, the challenge is. Mm -hmm. How do we get people to take a minute and step back and say, look, the things that we suffer as a result of majorly our attitude towards them or the decisions that we make as individuals. It doesn't matter what level you're at. Yes. As a child, somebody working in an office, somebody working for government, mm -hmm. right? Yes. It's the decisions you make. Yes. And oftentimes they are based on the values yes. that you have set. Yes. But how do we start to have that conversation with people who are looking for food? How do we start to have that conversation in a crisis with mm -hmm. education? And I think this is the challenge that how do we do this? I think for me, there's, I hear you, but the, in, from where I sit, there's hope mm. in the sense that Kenyans understand the importance of that conversation. That's why in various quarters, they show up to vote. They show up when there's a rally and they also go to religious places. They take time to, 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 to set, they set time aside, whether it's to go to the mosque or to the church. Mm. So it means we can create time for things that are important. Mm -hmm. The disconnect for us as Kenyans and for me, I always reiterate it, is on the questions mm. and the things that matter the most to us. We feel they are not our business, mm. but they're the business of other people. Mm. And I'll give an example. Um, at FIDA, we run a social accountability program where we've been trying to empower citizens to interrogate, especially at county levels, expenditure, budgets that come out. And we do understand. I mean, you don't need to be, most of us are not accountants. We are not um, financial experts, but taking an interest. An interest means either you avail yourself to interrogate or to listen to when the county government is raising an issue. If you're a lady who runs her business at the market, questioning why don't you have a clean market area? Why don't I have electricity? Give and look at, at Nairobi, for example. It is a city in darkness. Let's be honest. Mm. It's really dark. Citizens must ask the question. And then secondly, link the fact that we are paying taxes. 
we are not getting the services we deserve will we sit and complain kenyans are very good at complaining and especially those who have access on social to social media we raise all our questions there but yet when there's an opportunity for us to contribute and ask questions we don't show up and does it always mean it's going to be easy no mm. we must push back because the minute you're not pushing back from the exclusion and everyone else being renegated because for me it's intentional mm -hmm. that people are so caught up in the bread and butter issues that they cannot take time to ask question other things we have to sacrifice and realize even for democracies and countries that have achieved idealistic values there was a price to it and we don't need to go far a lot of our neighbors within the region have a very different integrity barometer in fact they make fun of us as a nation we have to be honest that kenyans are known not to be honest why is it that you'll go to tanzania or any other country and find different ideals there was a deliberate effort and ownership by citizens that this is our country we are going to make sure we run it the way we'd like to and we will participate in whatever level it is that we are required to do to, to to be part and parcel of kenyans on the other hand and i'm a kenyan we expect a reward for participation you'll go for meetings then people question okay so where is the transport where mm -hmm. is the fare and yes there is a cost of living issue but we cannot reduce every participation we expect to be part of as kenyans to a handout to being incentivized then that's where how we are where we are we should be able to take time and say look there's something going on at the town hall let me go listen i'll carry my water from the house or i'll save because in any case you are to have lunch somewhere even if it was a humble lunch let me take time and participate and the minute people know especially leadership that there is no price tag to your participation yep. the game will change yep. so it's not going to be easy but Kenyans must then see the next as that because we are always incentivized, we are always rewarded to participate. This mm. is what we are reaping. So we have to take, it's not going to be easy, mm. but there's a painful cost to it. Do parents go to school and ask for reimbursement? Do they say we are not going to participate in our school affairs because uh, we are not being rewarded? Mm. They don't because this is something mm. most important to them. This is their children's affairs. You, you know, I think it's, we are all grappling with how do we create the change we yes. want to see mm -hmm. and um just two reflections one um it is a change moment mm -hmm. i think there's a sense much as there's all this political you know shenanigans going on it is a change moment yes. there are things that can't continue as they are mm -hmm. and that is why there was such strong support for um the kenya kwanza uh you know uh, party they came in uh relative working against the state and the amount of you know whether there's contestation around some aspects of the election mm -hmm. that there was support on the ground because kenyans want change yes. how do we get that change and you know how do we deal with values mm -hmm. joko Budi, who's also been on this program talks about um and you know different publics that mm -hmm. there is the kenyan who goes to church mm -hmm. then there is the kenyan who goes to the political rally mm -hmm. those are different people mm -hmm. then there's the kenyan who engages with government mm -hmm. and when gauge, kenyans engage with government they feel that's an outside that's an outside entity to me yes when i go to church or when i'm within my homestead mm -hmm. that is internal to me so mm -hmm. there's this disconnect mm -hmm. because of a sense of uh, maybe ingrained injustice mm -hmm. that these institutions are more coercive to me than they are facilitated to me. So I identify more with my family, the yes. inner. Mm -hmm. So how do we get citizens to identify with the political system, mm -hmm. with their governance system? I think that's the question. If we're going to do family education, mm -hmm. we have to recognize that if you do family education in Nairobi, to somebody living in the informal settlements, working in the informal sector, mm -hmm. you can't, and you're talking values, well and good, mm -hmm. but then social justice, you know, you have a system that has marginalized people yes. and continues to do so. So I, I'm not really saying I have an answer, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying our realities. Yes. Yeah. How do we deal with that? Uh, for me, I feel that, and as you've said rightly, we have to address the factors that are impeding Kenyans to resonate with leadership and they need to have the proper and uh, leaders who have integrity in place across the board. I think for me one would be to ensure that 
we have continuous investment in civic education and political education. And this will have to be at the cost of Kenyans ourselves. I think we have often waited for support, which is not, there's nothing wrong with that. But we must be have the home uh, home uh, grown and home driven uh, efforts to ensure that we have political education especially because that's the disconnect that the Kenyans resonate and understand their lack of involvement whether it's intentional or deliberate has consequences mm -hmm. then secondly we must boldly as a country address inclusion political inclusion of everyone and this is going to be a very difficult conversation conversation and it must be driven by the citizens it's not a political question a lot of the problems you are facing as a country politically have been caused by the political class and they are we are expecting the political class to have solutions this cannot happen and that's why we have been pushing and this hope for example with the bipartisan talks there has got to be the deliberate effort to include everyone at the table it's not a question for the political class it's not their problem we are all in it as kenyans and we must address inclusion what does that mean we must go to the bottom and ensure that anyone who would have been marginalized or excluded has access to information information that they can understand and digest and have an opportunity to come to the table whether directly or indirectly but have their views heard and felt and rightly as you see what gives me hope is that there's that awakening in kenyan kenyans are aware i mean look at um, whatever has been happening in the recent past whatever your reason for raising your voice whether for or against the uh, political um, main discourse whether it's a protest or whatever we want to call it there is that association by kenyans that they want to be they have a view on the matter and mm. that for me is very important it's landmark compared to a lot of countries kenyans are largely invested in the political issue so that's the investment that we need to take and use it positively and ensure it's not lost at i mean it's not lost at the election day and that's why we keep on questioning that and and raising the awareness for Kenyans, elections is not the day of the election. We must move beyond mm -hmm. but and to be part of the process. And how we do that, I'll give an example. At the local level, again, we go to the local level when things are not going right. Whether it's injustice, whether it's um, we have even children amongst us who we know are criminals or have criminal elements, whether they're in conflict with the law, whether they're the small petty thieves, how do we address that as a community? Because then if we cannot collectively find solutions to rehabilitate them, to find a way out to make them better citizens, we cannot be fully part of the process at the top. And I speak, I, I mean, a lot of things people will say are idealistic, but they're not. They are practical solutions. If we go to the market day and you know you find a police officer, I'll just give an example, or a county council employee who perhaps people feel is not doing the right thing. Maybe they are trying to extort money from people. What do we do about it? And what power do we have within the confines of law? So there is hope. And for me, again, I say because Kenyans are invested in what is happening to them. The cost of living is not sparing anyone. So that's an opportunity to even start the conversation and take it further. What do we do about the country? How do we better manage our finances? And for me, that's a good start to ensure that we are all part but of the conversation. But let me ask this question. Yes. I mean, we have this conversation that Kenyan seems to have made a mistake when they went to the ballot and chose the leaders that they chose. Mm -hmm. If we take that narrative to its logical conclusion, then it would mean every five years Kenyans make a terrible mistake. Because if you look at the turnover mm -hmm. of the elected leaders, it's high. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we are saying something that isn't being listened to, mm -hmm. and we ourselves, even as we are saying it, we don't hear it. Mm -hmm. This thing that we refer to as corruption, can we pause a little bit mm -hmm. and perhaps examine it closely? Mm -hmm. We like the idea of ensuring that we get what we want. Call it a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. Parting with a few shillings seem to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And you take that matter, give it a full breath and look at everything that involves, say, law enforcement, like driving a car, mm -hmm. having the correct licenses, and not having it and the consequences that follow, mm -hmm. a little money helps solve that problem. Mm -hmm. But what does it tell you 
for you to look for an easier way of solving it, it means that what has been laid down as a solution for such a problem is burdensome. Mm -hmm. People do not feel that that process will serve their interest. Mm -hmm. So you do not look at that and say, if people prefer an alternative way, it's mm -hmm. not that they're corrupt. It's a coping mechanism that they have mm -hmm. for dealing with something which they feel ordinarily would be burdensome to them. It's something they'd rather not deal with. Mm -hmm. That's why the term coping mechanism comes into play. Mm -hmm. If you look at the choices of leaders, mm -hmm. yes, we seem to say they make a mistake. But it's like we know that these are the people who will provide us with the ease of passage. Because if you have leaders who represent this view that we have, mm -hmm. this coping mechanism, then we're in a good place. Because they will then now not force us to follow the route that doesn't serve our interest. So the politicians serve their interest. We also serve our interest. Now, there's this higher moral calling and platform that we say we should aspire to. Why should we? Mm -hmm. If we say that bribery is bad, why? It's against the law? Mm -hmm. Then why don't we change that law so that we set limits? Mm. For over speeding, you are only allowed to give a bribe of 200 shillings, no more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I, I, yeah, you, you, know, you can negotiate up to 200. You can negotiate up to 200, but mm -hmm. if it goes beyond then... Mm -hmm. It's a fine. Mm -hmm. It's a fine, yes. Mm -hmm. And then now, mm -hmm. the issue of the digital economy that Mwishmo Al was talking about comes into play. Mm -hmm. You have all my details. And I will pay the fine right there and then. And even if I don't, create an IOU system where you know at some point mm -hmm. I will have to pay you. I'm simply saying this. Yes. Eh? If we look at the matters that bedevil us in the same way we will, we've been looking at them for God knows how long, mm -hmm. you know what that means. We're not really going to make any movement forward. And I'm saying this. The people are speaking. We are speaking. We are actually telling anybody who cares to listen and ourselves that this is how we actually want to function and we mm -hmm. find it works for us mm -hmm. does it actually it's called a coping mechanism it works for you at the time it does because you do not have the faith that this long-term view that you keep talking about will actually work mm -hmm. so let me deal with what i can on a daily basis mm. if the other one works i will see it but for the time being then probably ct yes then what the people are actually expressing it's not a satisfaction with the current state of affairs it's a frustration. Yes, it is. They're venting. Yes, it is. When they keep changing the leaders, yes, it's because it they think, no, this I something is not what? working. Exactly. It's not working. Yes. yes. The problem is in the identification of the right leader. Mm -hmm. Yes. It may be in knowing, so how do I vet and know yes. that this is the right leader? Yes. Mm -hmm. But if the everybody who is coming up for election is using the top leaders that we have in our country as, you know, their moral compass. Yes. And everybody, all of us are looking at and comparing CCT and Taksumama. CCT is too soft, but at a Chaguliwa na nani. It's because we're looking at our national leaders, and which is why our topic mm -hmm. today is on yes. do our national leaders actually promote mm -hmm. Chapter 6 of our constitution on leadership, on integrity. When they behave the way they behave, when they go out there and they call each other William Z or Chieta or what, when they're using such words in public, they are do. they sending the right signals? Yes, they are applying the sentiments of chapter 6, but chapter 6b. Mm. Because, <laughs> <laughs> and let us see it for what it is. Mm. Because they better than us know exactly what chapter 6 puts yes. across as what is desired. Mm -hmm. They understand it so well that when the government that was tasked with the uh monumental burden of implementing this tax that they first started altering this chapter they made sure they made sure that they went to town in altering it mm. so that what we were left with was so bastardized that it actually can't do anything substantive now again they are speaking to us meaning this person we knew and whom we know this person when elected should give us what we desire we elect them mm. then they get there Listen, when people are sent to positions of authority, they change. Okay? They change. Now, that metamorphosis, let's not run away from it. What is it that makes them change the way they do? Because it's a conversation we have. Mm. They change. Mm. Now, when they are in a position where there's genuine power, they really change. To the point where we don't even recognize them. In, in fact, City, what you're speaking to is, it's interesting and this conversation is compelling mm. because on one hand, Anne, you talk about the family yes. um, and the values in the family and um, the issue of um, domestic relations, as mm -hmm. domestic violence. Mm. And the question I'd ask there is, 
as FIDA, you've been quite involved in this space. The women's movement has been involved. Mm. Do you think there's been an over-legal approach mm -hmm. to dealing with the social issues mm -hmm. in society at that level? Mm. And then at this other level, talking about leadership and integrity as ELOG, mm -hmm. um, you know, what would you say? Because my, my sense is that our electoral system is the, is the weakest link mm -hmm. in our democracy. And mm -hmm. chapter chapter six hinges on that mm -hmm. so that the way you get into nomination the way you get into being elected mm -hmm. is all about money and it's about you know uh, if you look at the nomination process if you look at there's all the violations of chapter six begin in the build-up mm -hmm. so the moment you get in you're beholden you're paying back, mm -hmm. be then the system breaks down again in that there are no checks or the checks that are there are superficial. Mm -hmm. They are not really bringing that individual accountability. Mm -hmm. So the system, to my view, is very broken. Mm -hmm. So on one hand, at family level, where possibly we can do a lot of influence, mm -hmm. we are not. So mm -hmm. we are not doing that family education. We are not talking about values. We are not, well, you, you know, know schooling system, ourselves. This system is speaking of which system is it? The one you say is broken. I am saying, in at family level, oh. our family system and values are broken to the extent that there is a lot of violence going on. And my question then is. Have, has the women movement that have really done a lot in bringing this issue to the fore, the mm. legislation, should is it time for us, to, for the women's movement to look and say, let's deal with this as a social issue mm. and let's change tact. But then also at the national level, it's the electoral system. It's the systems. That it's the syst and the systems that link the accountability, political accountability system. Mm. That system is not working. And if you tell citizens to hold leaders to account, how will they? Are you saying recall? But you I, know? Okay, I think mm -hmm. for me, if I may, because it's, it's quite a handful, and I also I'll try and attempt to respond to what City has raised in terms of uh, the convenience or, mm -hmm. or, or coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start with the family. And as you say, with I think one of the things we've done as a country, and we always raise it factually, is that we have tried to overly prescribe a solution for everything and you can't because a lot of problems there's no law there's no policy that will fix it and so in the instance of uh, family issues we've gone a step further to say the law is not sufficient mm -hmm. can we conduct awareness we've done a lot of civic education uh, alternative dispute resolution such as mediation and using uh, uh, opinion leaders within the community to try and resolve a lot of the cases that ideally don't need to go to court because you go to court the litigation system is acrimonious you'll end up um, having a winner and a loser so that does not preserve the family so we have been able to, to give solutions and the judiciary is aware that really especially in the family unit let's preserve the court system or the laws for matters that must go to court matters that are complex uh, such as um, possibly property property disputes uh, criminal cases for sure have to go through the, the the justice system but for other issues where we just have a disagreement or we are agreeing that we are not as 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 as, as good for the children as living under one roof as possibly co-parenting their solutions and kenyans by the way are really embracing the fact that you can co-parent you can raise children together it's not an enmity so there is hope in that um towards the system and that's the larger question that wanjiru has raised uh from our perspective as election players we have a very good legislative framework it was well thought out remember we spoke about the cyclic nature the problem is now when you have the vested interests who do not want to comply with the issue of timelines and i'll single out an example we are operating currently without commissioners at the ibc every kenyan knows that mm. next week mm. it will be one year after the elections we still don't have commissioners in the office have we raised that we have mm. do people need we know that we need to fast track they do mm. so we'll end up again history will repeat itself we'll end up very late in the day having office bearers yet 
reports after report have given the benefit of having commissioners in office at a good time. So is it a question of the system not being able or the legal provisions not being sufficient? They are. It's a vested interest. It's the fact that now we want to play uh, sort of, I mean, have interest and play games with what we know needs to happen. Mm -hmm. As a country, we are not even speaking about the issue of delimitation of boundaries. We are time bad. We are yep. supposed to have done it. And that requires a very sober legislation, uh, uh, legislative process, whether it's at parliament, whether it's at National Assembly or Senate, the politicians or the political class and the legislators especially have to embrace their mandate, which is to give life mm. to the law, devoid of your political interest. You mm. took an oath of office to safeguard the constitution. That's mm. not an easy oath. Mm. I've personally undertaken that oath in mm. my capacity as an advocate of the High Court. Mm. It's a very weighty oath. That means you must do the right thing. You must be able to put your heart of a political player aside and ask yourselves collectively, what are we expected to do mm. within the law as lawmakers? So that's where we are failing. And we have to push and keep pushing. And by the way, doing the right thing often has pushbacks. So we must be able to continuously keep the momentum and be able to do what is required, whether it's registration of voters in good time, whether it's investing everything. Everyone is now quiet on matters election mm -hmm. until the last minute mm -hmm. and we start running helter skelter. And we, I mean, we are doing the same thing over and over. So what, why should we expect different results? So but, but are, are, we quiet, way, are we really quiet on matters of election? I don't think we are putting sufficient pressure. We is who here? The Kenyans. The you voter. See, you the see. voter. The voter. You and see. I'll and I'll quantify. Please quantify. I'll quantify. I included. We mm. have given too much power to the political leader. Oh, yeah. They are there by virtue mm. of our vote. Yeah. So we must be able to recall our members of parliament, for example and ask them, what are you doing towards this milestone? It's something we must undertake as a country. And so we must empower the individual citizen to mm. be able to ask that question. How is and the individual powered? And I think that's the thing, the, yeah. the how-tos are said, uh, rather, you mm. know, pro prescribed. But then how? How do we I'll, empower a citizen to say, you know what, mm. you who is living, I mean, we, and we don't have to talk about the proverbial person who is the, the mamamboga, as we always say. The person who is living in their home with their children saying empower this individual mm -hmm. to be able to ask questions of their most immediate leader of the person whose vote then was given mm -hmm. how does this individual what because essentially what we're talking about go to your ward office yes have a conversation about this thing which you yes. said you would do yeah. what you ought to have done which you have not done yes we're asking for answers yes is that what we're talking about that's what we're talking about mm -hmm. and i speak again from a perspective where i know kenyans have done very well to collectively organize at grassroots level leave the petitions in those offices. say look we elected you and as a ward representative yep. we don't see you you have to answer certain questions and the constitution mm -hmm gives us very good mechanisms to be able to even recall members of parliament. Why are we not doing it? It's because, again, as I say, we have glorified leaders who are there by virtue of our vote. So we've seen and why, that. How has we, and how have we creatively uh, created that ecosystem of glorification? Mm. One, it's a corruption. Two, we are not able to ask the questions. I mean, why is it in our country we have to be pushed off the road for someone to pass yet it's not an emergency vehicle i mean those are the conversations and they're not easy conversations but we must ask this um i mean this Muheshimiwa mentality at the end of the day you are there to serve us mm. we not not that we are disrespecting mm. you but we put you in office you sort a job and we need to be able to have you answer us so we have to empower no we have to empower the citizen mm. to move away from the Muheshimiwa complex because How? that's what by How do we empower the citizen. The citizen now, is empowered by the constitution. Number one, mm. we must be able to limit the power that comes with whether it's um, money not earned well, mm. but two, that lack of access. And I, I mean, it's not difficult. These people, but, when but, they are looking and, for and votes, consider, yes. consider. You see, yes, there's a little, there's an excess here. Yes. How do you get the monenchi to understand yes. that this coping mechanism and compromise? Mm -hmm is what results in you allowing this Moshimewa to get away with murder. Hmm. Because if you accept the yes. things he gives you, you yes. may not think so. You may think it's a coping mechanism, but you've compromised. That's what you don't understand. Hmm. I think for me, we have the right opportunity right now. Yes. Every Kenyan is complaining about something. 
rightfully or not. Yeah. We must now take that conversation further for the Kenyan to understand we are in this situation. We also have a role to play in how we ended up where we are. There's something that was expected of us. Whether we were empowered to carry out that duty, we were not able to, but we are where we are because of the consequences no, but do, yeah. do, do, they, do we do we even uh, we talk about do we even understand mm. the corrupting influence of that sort of compromise it mm. gets to your soul it's not something that is academic it, it it gets to the very being that represents you i think for me what and that's why it's <laughs> it's not an easy thing but no, kenyans must be bold and where we take some faith is that especially for us who have gone to the grassroots areas and you see a lot of Kenyans who have come out to play their role they are doing it well mm -hmm. the first question we must start and even if we'll do it tonight and I would want to pose that to the nation why have we normalized such serious occurrences in our country we have as we speak a very sad situation happening at the coast in our nation but we have normalized it no one is coming out to ask what's the cost of these women and children and families who disappeared they are people's loved ones yeah it's not bothering us enough as kenyans and if that cannot bother us then will corruption of a hundred shilling 200 shillings mm -hmm. bother us that won't exactly so we have to go back to the basics where is it and on this city i hear you but we are the same kenyans God forbid a truck rolls just right now mm. outside the gate of Standard Group. People will start running to see what they can get for themselves. Yeah, what's it carrying? What is it carrying before you even rescue the driver? So that is how low we have sunk and it is going to take a lot of hard work. Yeah. We must get the shovels to dig ourselves out of this mud hole that we got ourselves into as a country and to be able to pay our part. Thank you very much. Anne Ireri is the chair of the Electoral Observation Group, ELOG, and also the executive director of FIDA Kenya. She's been our guest. When Jeroge Konyo has been our guest host, we've really come to the top of the hour. Time for us to leave, and we'll be back here tomorrow, Friday. Have a good one. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day.